I'm sure anybody who lives anywhere says, uh, you know, where we live is real and gritty and, and all that, uh, Pittsburgh and Detroit and all that sort of thing. And, and there is that sort of Midwestern work ethic and that resilience, right? Because, you know, all of these cities have had tough times, have lost population. Any region, any country is only as strong as its manufacturing base. You have to make things. You can't just be a service economy. You really, manufacturing is really how this country was built. But there is a core here of people and individuals who believe in themselves and believe in the region, you know, j not just records, but the arts in general. And it's really, it's really been neat to see and be a part of. For a long time, the only way you could listen to music was with records. And then the first thing that came out, at least in my generation, was eight tracks. And, and certainly that was great to be able to take music with you while you, while you went somewhere. But still, that never you know, matched the allure of getting a record, holding the record, being able to look at the liner notes and actually read them versus a CD liner notes, for example. There was just something about vinyl, I don't want to say it's uh, fetishized, but it, maybe in some respects it is, that there's a whole ritual to it, right? You take it out, you look at it, you put it on the turntable, you clean it, you put it on, and you sit down. And you know it's going to end, so, you know, 15, 20 minutes or so. So you tend to not get up and go do other stuff. You know, I think if, if I were the artist that put that out, that's the way I would want people to listen to my music, is to sit, think, absorb it, as opposed to put it on as background music while I'm doing the laundry or washing the dishes or whatever. So that aspect of it, I think, is what a lot of the people that are younger now that are really fueling this resurgence in vinyl are finding that they never didn't have that experience and now they can have that and in today's world where you know your phone's beeping every 20 seconds with a text message or a tweet or whatever it's a great way to disengage and uh, almost meditate if you will yeah, i grew up on vinyl you know i took my parents record collection for the most part confiscated it uh and, and you know it was just something always about it that i liked it, it, I think it was the experience sort of thing where you have to sit down and, and listen. The, the big complaint everyone had, which they still do, is, you know, where's the capacity? You know, we need more record plants because we can't get what we need when we want it. Uh, so I, I got the bright idea of I was going to open up a pressing plant, uh, which it was kind of a struggle, you know. It was a struggle just to get people interested in trying out the new pressing plant because there's apprehension of, you know, do you guys really know what you're doing? And we didn't really. Uh, and uh, I mean, the first year in particular was rough because, you know, at the very beginning we had one machine going. The first job we did took us probably almost a month to get done, and I think it was for 100 records. And we were really learning it from scratch. I think the first three months we were in business, we did maybe 12 jobs. It was fortunate that we got the amount of business that we did probably through the end of 2010 trial by fire. We, we got enough business that we were able to pay the bills and learn the craft. Well, the first step is getting the lacquer cut. Some people call it mastering. Once we get that audio file, we send it to our lacquer cutter, uh, Well Made Music, Clint Holly and his gang. They will put it on their lathe, a Neumann lathe, and cut that original groove into the side of the lacquer usually two sides to a record, so two lacquers. Those lacquers then just get sent to a plating shop or they get sprayed with silver. A metal image called a mother is made. Uh, then through electroplating, that metal mother makes a mirror image called a stamper. And stampers peeled off, and those stampers sit on our dies. So you essentially have the mirror image means the grooves are raised. It's compression molding, so like a grid on a waffle iron, leaves the impression in the batter. The raised grooves make the grooves in the vinyl record as the press comes down. So the vinyl starts in pellet form in the hopper, and it's melted to about 250 to 260 degrees in the extruder. The extruder pushes it out into a hockey puck shape, and the machine brings the vinyl forward, sets it on these stampers, 
The sampers have a negative of the music grooves in them. Then the biscuit is smushed. It's heated and then cooled. And after it's cooled down, it's sent back to be trimmed. And then after it's trimmed, it's put on the stack pin and then we can inspect it for imperfections. If it's just a straight color or color blend, then it really isn't much different than making a black record other than we have to mix it accordingly. But for especially things like splatters or something we have called coin flip or label blowouts or splits, those require a dedicated press operator at the press with an art table that we call behind them and a hot plate. We have some other proprietary techniques that we use to make some of the things that we do, but they all require that kind of specialized one person you know, attention. Yeah, they're much more labor intensive. So there's still some mystery in the process, if you will. Uh, there is some art to it. There is an art to making a record, to making a good quality sounding record. So I've got this material warmed on a hot plate. We're gonna make a splatter record. It's really important to have the material roughly the same temperature as a biscuit. Otherwise, you're gonna get edges that aren't chipping. What I'm checking for right now is to make sure it's gonna cut okay and that my edges aren't gonna strip. So this is what we're looking at. This is a standard splatter job. This is how we do it at Gotta Groove Records. It just the whole process, not just of making the record, but then once it's made and listening to it and making sure it's a quality record. Uh, every record that we make uh, gets brought through one of the three quality rooms and we're essentially looking for anything that wasn't on the test press. So like a noise at the beginning or some staining on the records or that sort of thing, we just kind of stay on top of it. If they get a little bit noisy, we go out, make some suggestions, hopefully we get the next stack better. It's kind of like every, rec every stack of records that I bring in, I try to make it better than the last. So we just kind of bring in the records about 60 or 70 at a time in each room, sift through them, listen to, uh, put on the most recent one, listen to a few songs, go back out, kind of pick up where we left off, and just continue to monitor the job as it's going. But we'll weigh them, we'll keep an eye on it. There's not really a lot of hard and fast requirements, but the weight of a record will tell you a lot about it because that the very edges of the record uh, are the last grooves to be filled, even though they're the first of the record. So they're the hardest to get sounding good, and they're your first impression. So a lot of times you have to press a lot of vinyl out the sides just to get those beginnings to sound good. And once you're past the beginning, a lot of the, re the rest of the record is usually a lot simpler than the beginning. But it's just that first impression, just getting those first few revolutions sounding good are the hardest ones to make sound good. You know, we are very quality focus and really from the very beginning you know our approach has been we, we want to put records out that we would want to buy because I think that's tied to the longevity of the format as well you know you want people to appreciate the quality of what they're buying to, to keep buying it you know you want it to be a good experience and we try to keep that in the forefront of our minds because what we're making some kid is taken home and taking it out and going through that whole ritual and hopefully enjoying it the same way we did. And, and so to us, that's like, yeah, we want to make sure we're delivering a quality product and that experience is all it can be for our customers. The thing is that a customer is really impacted by the first thing they see when they open a box. Before they hear their record, they're going to look at it. So when the record makes its way off the press through the QA guy, 
Um, they'll end up out here stacked on these spindles. Lacquer between every 10, it helps keep the record flat. Comes over into the packing department, the assembly tables where each record is sleeved, each record is inspected for any cosmetic issues, chips, cracks, damage labels. They're gonna do the visual inspection, sleeve all the records, and then from there go on to the actual assembly of putting it in the jacket, download codes, posters, everything else that goes with the product, whether it's stuffed in a poly bag, or it's shipped just the way it is, or it's even put through the shrink wrapping machine and taken to the next step which this is actually something that people are very intense about, how good their shrink wrapping looks. We make a point of packaging everything as safely as possible is, and shipping things in manners that are least likely to result in damage to the product at the end. I've been in bands for probably 30 years. I've run a record label. I've done a lot of this stuff on the other end of it. I mean, a lot of the people in this shop are musicians, so we've all been on the other end of this too. It's something that actually makes us a little different than a lot of other pressing plants. I'm confident at this point, confident that vinyl's not going away. And you know, some of that is because it never really went away. Even though I stopped buying records when CDs came out and you couldn't really find many records anymore, certainly not newer records unless you were an audiophile. Um, you know, as I've been in this business, I've come to find that what was keeping a lot of the smaller independent plants going was the, the punk and metal scene. Uh, and prior to that, the DJ scene. You know, some of these plants have been around since the 30s or 40s. So you'd think, well, how could that be? Well, there was a segment of the population keeping vinyl alive. You know, uh, the marker I always use is, we'll have somebody come in, they're a truck driver picking up something, they've never been here before. What do you guys do? We make records. They still make records? You know, when I stop hearing that, then I know it's kind of at the level of mass consciousness, you know, that maybe we've plateaued. But I do see it continuing to grow, eventually plateauing, because there are people who want to own something physical to represent their taste in music. And that's not gonna go away. In our first three full months of business, we did 44 projects. Um, last year, we did 1,700 projects. Every year's gone up exponentially. We have two shifts. Uh, we have had two shifts for a couple of years now. The, the work is out there. You know, for me, it's, it's about the employees here. I mean, it's certainly about our customers and delivering great product to them. But personally, you know, to give people an opportunity to have a job, and to hopefully grow with the job and enjoy working here and, and perhaps make a career out of it. And you know, we were able to finally this year offer health insurance to our employees, which we couldn't afford to do before. You know, those things to me are all you know, significant. I'd like to see this place here with our employees engaged and Cleveland owned and Cleveland based. And, uh, providing opportunities to even more people down the road.